Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to stay here. I feel much more secure than to be over the baptism pool. Yes. Health and safety in the first place, yes. Okay. The topic for today in my presentation is God on trial. God on trial. I was inspired by a title of a play written by Eli Wiesel, uh, an Israeli of Romanian descent, uh, a Jew uh, who lost his family, majority of his family, during the Holocaust in Auschwitz mainly. And he wrote a play, Trial of God. And I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but I recommend to read this play. Particularly, you can read the, the introduction or the preface in the play uh, to explain you the real events that inspired him to, uh, to, go, uh, to go into this play. Uh, today we are talking about God on trial, the Old Testament, and genocide. Okay, uh, let's go with the second slide. Okay. So these are the starting points I'll try to answer uh, to these three questions. What is genocide? What does God have to do with it? And how should we understand the cases of genocide in the Old Testament? Firstly, let's start with the definition of genocide. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, the definition of genocide is a presentation on its own. Because uh, it's a very complex idea, it's a very complex uh, concept. So we can discuss about that for hours, even not for days. I have used a summary of the United Nations definition of genocide. Uh, genocide as a legal term is relatively new. It was coined probably immediately after the Second World War. Uh, and it's been very prominent news uh, in the last 40, 50 years. So genocide is intention, plan, and act of executing entirely or partially people of all ages and gender on the basis of their political, religious, sexual, national, and other aspects of identity. So that's what genocide is. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, and in the Biblical Hebrew, there is no term for genocide. There is no counterpart exactly for genocide. The closest cognate in Biblical Hebrew is the noun herem, herem, which means ban, or something that was devoted to the Lord, something that is devoted to utter destruction. Uh, this, this noun signifies something that cannot be substituted, something that cannot be redeemed, something that you can, can't pay for that, but this should happen for anything or anybody that is harem. The verb haram appears mainly in hifl, so it's mainly causative, so to cause something to be utterly destroyed, or to cause something to be completely devoted to the Lord. It is very in, uh, important to say that intentions, orders, and events in which this noun, herem, was committed are mentioned in the Pentateuch, in Numbers 21, 1-3, Deuteronomy 3, 1-7, and also 13, 15 to 18. That's in the Pentateuch. But we should be very careful that while in Numbers 21 and Deuteronomy 7, God is ordering Herem to certain tribes and nations, in Deuteronomy 3, 1 to 7 is actually a recollection by Moses what happened to uh, a king, king of Og, and they, they, uh, that they utterly destroyed. So basically, in Deuteronomy 3, 1 to 7, it's not an order from the Lord to destroy the nations, but something that they mentioned they did it. But usually the scholars 
signify, uh, focus on this text because God, God did not react to that. And later, God, to a certain extent, approved that. The last case of something that resembles harem is in 1 Samuel 15, 18. You know that uh, event when Saul, the first king of Israel, he was told to do something to a very specific nation, and he did not do that. Because of that, he was deposed of being a king. And what are the reasons for this to happen? The reason number one is to eliminate potential abomination. That's what we find in uh, Deuteronomy 7, 4 to 5. So in order to avoid being contaminated religiously, morally, by other tribe, by other nation, this harem must happen. And if you go to Deuteronomy 7, there is a specific list of nations who are part or should be part of this utter destruction. And secondly, it is an execution of punishments over a wicked nation, just like Amalek in 1 Samuel 15. So this is, in a nutshell, what's going on in the Old Testament about something that is very close to the idea of genocide. Let's go further. There has been a strong criticism, attracted strong criticism from so-called New Atheism. So New Atheism criticized these texts. And actually, they say that because of that, can we have that on the screen, please? Thank you. So one of the, uh, one of the leaders of this New Atheism is definitely Richard Dawkins. In his book, God Delusion, uh, among the other things, he said, particu particular, particularly, particularly in the line of certain events that look like genocide. And he says that the Bible cannot be a source of desirable morality. Why? Because you've got these cases of genocide. You've got these cases of harem. You've got these cases where utter nations were completely destroyed. So, if I was... Part of the discussion, I would tell to Mr. to Professor Dawkins. Professor Dawkins, I'm sorry, he's not a proper Mr. He's just uh, he's also a professor of zoology. I would ask him, what is that desirable morality, please? How can you define what is de desirable morality? What's that? He is a proper atheistic evolutionist. Could you please tell me what's morality? Where do you find the source of your morality? So probably that would be my first question. But anyway, let's focus on the biblical texts. Alistair McGrath, professor of systematic theology from Oxford, he responded to this by saying, we should pay attention to the national context. The Israelites fought for their survival and identity. Basically, all these events were harem is happening, they are happening at a very specific period of their history. When they went into Egypt, they went as a family, as a clan. When they got out of Egypt, they got out as a nation. And now they're going towards the land that they were given. And it's their survival and their identity. Also, the first case of genocide happening during their first king, it's their first king. It's a new monarchy. They are establishing themselves. So this is happening in a very specific time. Secondly, McGrath says that we should pay attention to a progressive revelation. The Israelites' understanding of God developed further throughout the history. So we should not take these cases says McGrath, as standard cases, how God considers genocide. However, there is a counter response by Catherine Dell. She is an Old Testament scholar from Cambridge. She wrote a very interesting book uh, with the title, Who Needs the Old Testament? 
And she says, contextualization does not take away the moral difficulty that such commands and events took place. The only thing we can do is not to follow such examples. Basically, she says, you can't make an amnesty or give an amnesty to these events. They happened. They have been recorded in the Bible. So we should acknowledge them. But, she says, we can choose not to follow these examples. She continues in her response now directly towards Dawkins. And she says, we need to understand that between us and our morality today, and the morality of those times, there is a cultural gap. Among historians and sociologists today, there is an expression called the presenter's mistake. The presenter's mistake is when we apply our sociological, moral, and philosophical values to people in the past, and we judge them or evaluate them through these lenses. So we need to acknowledge that there is a cultural gap between us and them. So Catherine Dell, she points out to holy war led or approved by gods. And that was a norm in ancient Near East. So the idea of the holy war was something that was approved by a deity. We have that case in Joshua 5, 1, 14, Joshua 6, and later in Joshua 7. This is very, very interesting situation, and I'm going to return to this text. Number two, she says, destroy or will be destroyed was their situation. So they had to fought against other nations in order not to get into the same destiny. Second, she says, Punishment for the wicked nations was another reason why this happened. So, there is a huge discussion in Theodicy whether God punishes, whether God uh, kills someone, whether God takes away life. In the Bible, it is quite clear that God takes away life, and there is no problem with that, because God is the life giver. He's got the right to give life and to take it away. Only Him. Then, number three, she says selectivity in argu argumentation. Dawkins ignores the fact that accepting God leads to avoid destruction. This is very interesting. When you read about Cherem in Leviticus 27, and when you read about that in Numbers 21, when you read about that in Deuteronomy, and when you read in the book of Joshua, because everything in Jericho, humans or things, they were devoted to utter destruction, if it's Cherem, means that this is not redeemable. You can't substitute it with something. You can't pay for that. However, if you remember, there was one family led by a woman called Rahab, that did not suffer destruction in the city of Jericho. So, if the city was Cherem, if everything was and everybody devoted to utter destruction, how did she and her family survive? So, obviously that God, when human beings are in question, who accept Him as their God and Savior, He can even abolish these commands of utter destruction. That's interesting. It is also interesting that there was a, uh, a, there was a person who broke this rule, and he took three items out of Jericho. His name was Achan. Achan was an Israelite, and because he was caught in this act, he was punished with an utter destruction of him and his family. Which means that this harem that is mentioned here is not motivated by pure nationalistic agenda. It is actually an objective value and rule that is above every single nation. Okay, can we go further? Thank you. Now, 
Christopher Wright uh, is another scholar who responded to, uh, to this uh, argument of, uh, of Dawkins, to this, to this critique. He says, number one, God is not only a source of blessing, but he is also the ultimate judge who punishes the wicked, and at some points he uses in that human agents. He says that happens in the Bible all the time. Number two, the cases of genocide during the period of conquering the land were limited events. How do we know that? Because not every single nation they encounter on this road was utterly destroyed. They were exactly told that they should not go, uh, go against Moab, against Ammon, and against the nation of Edom. Why? Because they were their, their relatives. Also, the rhetoric of Joshua in the book of Joshua regarding the events of total destruction is hyperbolical. This is actually an overstatement. Because the later books of the Old Testament, like the Judges, for example, they report that certain nations which were given to Joshua to destroy actually survived. So never actually a complete genocide happened in the book of Joshua. Number four. The Canaanites were wicked, but God applied the same punishment to Israel when they became wicked too. If you go to Deuteronomy 28 to 30, you're going to find that breaking the covenant of God actually attracts the same punishment against Israel if they break God's covenant. Number five. Fairness is a slippery concept. So he's talking about intrinsic idea of righteousness, of fairness, and extrinsic. Intrinsic is when a person commits a crime, he's got their day in the court of justice, and the person is properly punished according to the law. And the person says, that's fine. I committed something wrong, and the punishment is just. It's fair. But on the other side, another person committed the same crime, but somehow the court says you can go free, or you can have a suspended sentence, or you can have less years than the previous person. So the previous person says, this is not fair. We did the same thing, but the punishment is not basically the same. So Christopher Wright basically points out to a relative feeling of justice. And finally, he says anticipation of the final judgment, God will ultimately punish all unrepentant sinners. So even if you go to the New Testament, so this story of Old Testament and Old Testament being cruel in Old Testament happening these things, but in the, other testament, in the, in the New Testament everything is cool, everything is fine, Jesus is excellent. Uh, obviously for certain people is a problem. And some of them, they, throughout the Christian history, they rejected the Old Testament, they accepted certain parts of the, of the New Testament, and so on and so forth. But if you go to the book of Revelation, as I imagine you went this, this morning, you can find that there are also descriptions of total destruction of the wicked. The point is that when the Bible is speaking about complete destruction of the wicked, the Bible is talking about God's judgment. And usually God's judgment has three things, three points to remember. Number one, human beings are warned what is good, what is evil. They know what to choose. And they are told what is good and what is evil. Number two, when evil thing happens, God always takes the culprits through investigation. Always there is investigation. And during that investigation, particularly in Genesis from 3 to 11, there is always an element of mitigation, 
always God tries to find a reason to mitigate the punishment. And when the investigation is over, then the execution comes of the judgment itself. So God, when applies certain punishment in the Old Testament, he is not arbitrary. God is ethically predictable when he applies certain punishment to certain individuals or groups of people. Let me conclude. The moral consistency of God's behavior towards human wickedness and the attitude behavior of the repentant is there in the Bible. So God does not make difference between nations, between genders, between, uh, uh, between color of skin, anything. He looks at the person or group of people, their moral values, their behavior, and their, in the first place, their relationship with him. Rahab, she was a woman, she was a pagan, and she was a professional prostitute. She accepted God. She, she demonstrated fear from the Lord, and she was saved. Not just her, but her family as well. So for God, it's not important the past, but also how human beings react when they are given a chance. Statistically, these events of annihilation of a group of people or nations are not prevalent in the Old Testament. They happened in a very specific time and they disappeared from the later history of Israel in the uh, Old Testament. Finally, the interpreters should choose not to follow Hechem commands and events as analogy for contemporary application. We have a choice. Why should they follow these examples? There are other examples in the Bible as well. But I'm not following them. Because we choose to follow the total idea what the Bible says about morality, about the treatment of other people different than us. So, what does God have to do with genocide? Only at certain points in the history of Israel and nothing after that, definitely. What, are, what about the examples of genocide? We should choose not to follow them. The cases of genocide were very precise. There was a prophet. The prophet said what God told him. The prophet confirmed that very often through several witnesses. And God, after that, approved that. We should be very careful. Who is the prophet? Because in Rwanda in 1994, there was a radio station, and that radio station at one point broadcasted something from a person claiming that she or he received visions from Mary, mother of Jesus. And to some extent, this very ambiguous broadcasting contributed to the genocide of the Tutsi tribe in Rwanda. So we should be very careful with the prophets because today we have the Bible, the testimony of the total Bible, of the entire Bible, and we should compare what we listen from certain prophets. Definitely, genocide is not something for today. Something that is not substituted, something that we can't pay for, something that we can't change anything from, something that is herem for today, is the salvation provided by God to every single being. We can't change that. We can't take it away. It is free given to everyone. Let us preach that and let us offer that as a news to other people around us. Amen.